Javier Ramirez, I'm going to tell you about highly available distributed databases. Uh, who am I? Well, uh, just briefly, I've been working like you know, for a few years in uh, doing software. Uh, and for the last years, I've been moving more and more from web development to the data and distributed systems, I really that part. And uh, yeah, I'm one of the founders of something called Tiawaki, in which we basically do uh, big data and cloud projects. And uh, Prenda Toramar, which is like something for Spanish children to learn how to Toram. Uh, enough about me, because I want to tell you about distributed databases, how they work, and why this is important, because databases store the data of your business, and that data is stored in data centers. And data centers sometimes can have a few challenges. Like, for example, imagine your database is uh, kept there at data center, IBM in Japan a few years ago. Uh, if your database is there, and it's the only database you have, then you have a problem. Because even if some of these drugs, they were still working, I doubt from the outside anyone could connect to that database. It's not only about earthquakes. It can be also about storms, for example. Uh, just last year, a uh, data center of Google in Europe was hit not by a lightning strike, but by four consecutive lightning strikes. And they were to prefer one. So yeah, it's happened. It's the strike. The systems start like, oh, uh, no trolling, lightning strike, everything is under control. We uh, restore things, blah, blah, four. They were not to prefer that. And you know, so some data was, lo was lost because you know, it's... Uh, you, you are not prepared for these things. And if you are talking about lightning strikes, we can talk about the cloud. A few years ago, uh, one of the Facebook responsible for data centers get a call, hey, we have a cloud in the data center. It's like, yeah, I know we have a cloud in the data center. No, you are not getting this. The air conditioning is malfunctioning, so it's causing condensation. There is like a cloud inside the data center. It's raining on the servers. <laughs> and it was raining on the servers. And, and if your database is there, and that's the only copy you have, then you have a problem. And it can be also like chipmunks. Like, for example, chipmunks like, took a half of the uh, uh, Yahoo data centers a few years back. Not only that, there was like a trolling with Nasdaq, the, uh, I, the tech uh, technology stock in the New York. Nasdaq was not once, but twice, stopped for a few hours because of uh, squirrels just, you know, uh, away the cables. And that's why when you are putting like uh, under a uh, water cable, like submarine wave, they put like cable around because the sharks really like to buy the cable. So, you know, internet is, is a dangerous place. But of all these stories of, of how you, your uh, connectivity, your data centers can fail, one of my favorites happened between Georgia and Armenia, like very close to the border. <laughs> this woman, for a few hours, she was like, the most hate person for a lot of people, a lot of geeks in particular, in Armenia. Because, you know, she was like every day, as she's the spread hacker, she was like getting, you know, trying to get like copper from, uh, to, to sell it later. And accidentally, she found like the, one of the cables that provides internet for Armenia. So she got on that, and for almost 24 hours, the country was without internet. And, you know, and if you have a data center in Armenia, then you have a problem because you know, no one's going to be able to access your database. So, you know, internet is, is very, it's a, it's a very dangerous place. You have to be careful with that. And it's not just for fun. I mean, uh, it's not that, oh, yeah, these are like, you know, isolated cases that you are putting here. No, just last year, these are all the providers that had like any problem with data centers, basically all of them. I mean, because, you know, this is, it's going to happen for, for a lot of things. Because, you know, complex systems are going to fail for sure. For example, rack space. Uh, the truck with the deliveries for the canteen comes to rack space. They, they hit the wall. The wall goes down. The servers go down. It happens. You have, like, hackers, mechanical failures, uh, human errors, electric. I mean, it, it can fail in many, many, many ways. So if you care about your data, you should distribute it and keep it like in different places, or else you, know, uh, you, you can suffer the consequences. And the consequences, depending on your business, they can be like quite bad. For example, Starbucks, they were for uh, a whole afternoon, they couldn't sell any coffee in the US because a network problem between the point of sales and the uh, central database. So they couldn't sell. Some of the Starbucks stores, they were like giving the coffee for free. Some had to close because they couldn't sell. And that's the whole Starbucks in the US, one afternoon, a lot of money. And it can be even worse. It can, it can go with your feelings, like Tinder users, you know? Yeah, 
Exactly. There was an outage, and for a few hours, they lost all the contacts. And they were like, how ca- I, am I going to lose my virginity now? It's like, no. So, I, so, that's, it, it's, so if you care about your users, you should really think about distributing your data. Because it can have an impact on your business. And uh, as a plus thing, if you distribute your data, uh, in many cases, you are going to get like, better performance and cheaper than having a huge database with all your data. So it's, it gets, it's getting interesting. And you can tell me, oh yeah, of course, if my database have a problem, I have a backup. So a backup is cool. It's like, it's like the most basic level of distributed data. So you have your database, you have your backup. It's not highly available, but you know, you have something there. And of course, we all have backups. <laughs> Vodafone also have backups on the same building. So you have to be careful, of course, uh, remember not to keep your backup on the same place of your main copy. They lost one year of data because of fire in, in one building. But you are not doing this. So the most basic replication, like highly available replication thing, is like, yeah, I'm old. So <laughs> if, if you don't know what this means, yes, don't worry. It's, you know, it's something that happened in the 80s, and we are trying to forget 90s, I don't know, whatever. So the thing is, the, the, yeah. So the, um, the first level of replication is master slave which is we, it's what uh, any relational database has been doing for years. And, and it was like flawlessly. It's perfect. I mean, master slave, the way it works is like you have a master server, and you have one or several replicas or slaves. So what you are doing is like every time there is like a write, and by a write, I mean like a delete, uh, insert, whatever, update. So every time there is a change on the database, you always change on the master. And the master is going to replicate to the, to the uh, slaves of the replicas. How does it work? Well, you have something called the binary log, the write ahead log, something like that, in which every time there is an operation, basically it's written here, and this is propagated to the slaves. So the first time the slave connects, it makes like a full copy of the uh, master database. After that, every time there is a change, you only have to propagate the change. The slave is going to replicate exactly the same operation, so they are, they are, they are all going to be consistent. And that's, you know, that's how it works. And this works quite well, and it escapes like, you know, fairly well, but with a few problems. For example, all the operations have to be replicated on all the slaves, which is not bad if you have like a small, cute database. But if you have, like, uh, let's say, a petabyte of data, having a petadate of data in all of the replicas and in the master, it's starting to be a little expensive and not really efficient. So the first thing is like all the operations need to be replicated on all the slaves. Apart from that, you have like very good scalability for reads. But if you need to write a lot, you have a problem because you have only a database, the master, in which you can write. And if that master is the one in the data center with the squirrels, then no one in your system can write. They can keep reading, which is like good enough, but they cannot write. So it's not really, it's highly available up to a point, but not really for writes. Uh, so yeah, you have basically the single point of failure, the master database, and you don't want to have that. So what can we do? Okay, there is like another kind of replication, which has been around also for a few years, which is like the multi-master cluster replication, uh, whatever you want to call it. In this case, you are not going to have like a master and a replica. You have like a lot of servers. All of them are awesome. So you know, you, yeah, exactly. It's like yeah, all my servers are masters. So the way it works is like very, very easy. Again, what you have is like same scenario as before. Every one of the uh, of the servers have like the binary log. So every time anyone is writing to in any of them, uh, that log is propagated to all the others. So they all apply all the operations, so they all are uh, synchronized. And you know, so you can write in any of them, they are going to be like uh, working, and this works fairly well if these servers are close to each other. Because if I have, imagine I have like, you know, this multi-master because I want to be, I don't know, you know, now the cloud, you have like different availability zones, so you can be in two data centers, quite close to each other, both in Europe, with very, very little latency. If you are in that scenario, that's not bad. Because, you know, propagating the changes between different servers, that's going to work. But if you are have servers only in Europe, and you use it in the, uh, America, for example, then it's not going to be that fast for them to do things. So this works OK. But the thing is, again, all the operations have to be replicated on all the masters. You have, again, a big database. 
you can have, uh, when I'm speaking about a big database, I'm thinking of uh, Netflix, for example. Last time I checked, they had like more than 7,000 servers only for the Cassandra cluster. 7,000 servers. That's big. Uh, imagine if you had to have all that data on a single machine. Yeah. Or Facebook, they have more than uh, 20,000, I would say, servers only for analytics. Only for analytics, 20,000 servers. So if you have that amount of data, you know, good luck with <laughs> replicating all the operations on the 20,000 servers all the time. You don't want to do that. You cannot afford to do that. So basically, that's the, that's the thing. If you have like synchronous replication, which is what you want to have and what you usually have on relational databases, if you want to have like a synchronous replication, so they all have the same data at the same time and everything is the way it should be, the way I was taught in university, things work and they were lying to me. But anyway, so if you want to have that, uh, and uh, if you have like bad latency, then you know the system is going to be slow and uh, you need to have like uh, transactions and locks. And when you have a lock in one, in one of the servers, no one can write to that. So it, it's starting to be yeah, a bit uh, interesting. If we have asynchronous replication, that's even better. Because then you are going to get conflict. You have asynchronous replication. Maybe someone is writing in this server and someone in this other server uh, on the same row. And you have a trolling. The way you deal with that is not really easy. In most of these... Uh, the classic multi-master scenario is like, yeah, database, I'm not going to, if you choose asynchronous, that's your problem, so I'm not going to help you. But you know, it, it works. And this is, you know, the way a lot of systems have been working for a long time. By the way, not only relational databases, Redis and other NoSQL systems use like this kind of similar things. So this is not bad, but uh, you know, as you see, it has like a few problems. What I would want, and, and what I've been, talking about, you know, what, what I'm going to be talking about for the next minutes is like a system which is like always on, no matter what. I can always write or read or do anything I want with my system. Uh, I, I want to scale both the reads and the writes, not only the reads or not only the writes. Uh, I don't want to keep all the data in all the servers because if I, want, if I have like a petabyte of data, I don't want to have a server with a petabyte of disk attached to that because that's ridiculous. And uh, I want it to run on cheap servers because, you know, a big server is like, a, I, I cannot afford to have that. And if it breaks, I'm going to have a problem. I want it to be, I want to be as close to the users as possible so I have low latency. And, you know, and why not? I want it to be able to add more power if I need it or if I have like, no, less uh, users or less data, just scale down. This is, I mean, it's like, uh, is this asking too much? I mean, I, uh, no, I mean, it's not. So, so this is what I'm going to tell you about. And the good news, uh, this is totally possible. The bad news are you have to forget about many of the things that you take for granted when you are working with databases. Because relational databases are very cool. A relational database is a system in which I put data in, I don't know how many tables, I can always query for the data. There is always a query that can get me exactly what I want. It can take years to get the results, but it's going to work. So, you know, relational databases are like very cool and, and everything is, I'll have like transactions, integrity, foreign keys, they're really awesome. The only problem is like to have all that awesomeness they don't really scale that well. Yeah, okay, there are some exceptions now. Databases are changing, but yeah, what I'm going to tell you about applies to not only Tono SQL, but to modern relational databases too. So the thing is, you have to forget a few other things. And the first thing is like, I probably all of you are familiar with this thing called the CAP theorem. I have to put it here because, yeah. Uh, so this basically says, um, if I have a system, and ideally, I would like the system to be consistent, so if I have like several servers, all of them have the same information all the time, there is no discrepancy, so everything is cool the way I'm, it's supposed to be. I want the system to be like always available, so I can always write and read, and I want the system to be uh, tolerance to partitions. If there is like a network problem, one of the servers goes down, I still want to keep working. Problem is, this is not possible. So you have to choose between two of these. You can have a system which is like always available and it's always consistent, but if one of the nodes is disconnected, 
uh, you cannot keep walking because you know it, it's, it wouldn't be consistent if you are writing in one node and in the other without connectivity. They cannot replicate the change. So yeah, uh, so you have to choose one of these options, and you cannot really choose a system which is not partition tolerance because, as you've seen, on the internet things are going to break. On the internet, you are always going to have these connections. So you have to choose between this and this. And my talk is about like highly available databases. So we are going to be sacrificing consistency, which is what a lot of modern systems are doing. And you get what, what is called uh, something which is eventually consistent, which means if I'm making a change for a few minutes, seconds, hours, days, whatever the scale you are working with. But if I make a change for a while, different servers can provide different results. And this is the, the, uh, an easy way to think of this is like uh, if you're thinking of DNS, you change the DNS record and then you are telling people, hey, are you seeing the old site or the new one? Are you seeing the old one? So in the end, everybody is seeing the new site. That's fine. But for a while, you, you never know. You are going to reload and which version I'm getting? Oh, I don't know. Take a bet. So that's, that's the definition of eventually consistent. In the end, eventually, Everybody is going to see the same. For a while, it's like, yeah, not really. Have you changed it? Yes, I've changed it. But you know, it's just taking longer than usual. That's how it works. So that's Cathern. And, uh, and I'm going to, and, and with that in mind, I'm going to tell you how distributed databases work. And the first thing is like, okay, distributed databases, uh, this is this like something like weird, the future. Because if I ask you about relational databases, of course, you know, you know, MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, a lot of uh, relational databases you've been using for a long time. But if I ask you about you know, uh, distributed databases, well, there are a few. Actually, there are a few. You have, uh, for example, Amazon DynamoDB, or uh, Google Bigtable, uh, the open source version of Bigtable, which is Apache HBase, uh, Project Voldemort by uh, LinkedIn, you have React, Cassandra, FoundationDB, a lot of, lot of options. Actually, MongoDB is not here, but it should be here too. So uh, th there are a lot of distributed, there are more than this. But these are actually some of the most popular. I'm forgetting a few here, but that's fine because, you know, the, the message here is like, it's not something abstract I'm talking about. There are a lot of products that are already working with this kind of technology, of this uh, distributed system, which are like highly available. And, uh, like, and, and, and many of them share the same architecture. For example, you take Cassandra. Cassandra takes basically the data model from Bigtable and then the, uh, the cluster model from Amazon. So a lot of these systems are like putting the same things together, the same principles, you know, to achieve a system which is consistent. So what I'm going to do now is telling you the basics, how you can get a system like that. And a lot of what I'm going to tell you is like based on these two. But you know, there are like different things that, uh, that work for all of them. So when you are designing your uh, own distributed database, there are some decisions you have to, 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 uh, to make in order to uh, have the system. It's like, okay, how am I going to distribute the data? Because I told you already that I don't want to have all my data on uh, all the machines. I want to have only parts of data in somewhere and parts of data in, in, in other places. So that would be the first decision. How do I do that? Then it's like, how do I replicate data and I make sure if one of the copies goes down, I still have more copies and it's not going because, you know, if one copy goes down and I don't have more copies, I don't have high availability. So replication. Then conflict resolution. As we saw, we are going to have conflicts. At some point, the uh, different machines are going to disconnect and we'll have like eventual consistency. How we are going to deal with that? Then if I have a cluster, if I have like 20,000 machines on a cluster, I want to know which are members of the cluster. And I want to know in which status they are. Are they ready to take data? Are they starting? Are they stopping? Are they available? How are they doing? How am I going to work when there's a partition? And how am I going to deal with uh, incremental scalability if I'm going to deal with that? So these are all the things I'm going to be explaining in 30 minutes. It's not bad. So data distribution. This one is really easy. I want to put data on different uh, nodes, different servers, in an easy way. So you basically apply a hash function. So what you do is like, OK, uh, I'm going to take the, let's call it the primary key for saying something. I'm going to take the primary key. I apply a hash function, and it's going to give me a number between 
0 and 32 for saying something easy, and then all the you know all the uh, records with the number zero they are going to the same server. All the records with number with number one they are going to go to another server. So I just apply a hash function, and it, it's very easy to know where I can put the uh, the results. In some cases, this is like a bit more complex, but basically it's applying a hashing function and just getting the uh, results somewhere. This is an abstraction that you will see a lot in a lot of systems, in, uh, in Cassandra, in Mongo, a lot of them. They call the cluster the ring. So basically, in this case, I'm saying I have like, you know, uh, 32 partitions. And that's why I say I can have like 32 partitions and maybe have only four physical nodes. So each of these nodes is going to take eight partitions. Everything has into zero is going to come to this node, has into one here, to two, to three, to four, again to the node zero. So with this system, I can have like an easy way of taking a whole database and put it in, in this case into four different servers. If I can, you know, so I can play with the number of servers here and how many partitions they are going to keep. But doing something like this is very easy to divide. So give, if you give me the key to insert or to read, I know exactly in which server I have the data, I can connect to that. And that's cool. But with this system, as I said before, uh, data is still on one node only. I want to have replicas of this data, because if, if not, I'm going to, you know, if I lose node zero, I'm losing like the, the fourth of my system. And I don't want that to happen. So I, I want to not only distribute data, I have to replicate data. How can we do this? There are, again, different strategies. But one which is like fairly easy, you define a number of uh, replicas. Typically, you want to have three. Because if you have three copies, and then you have uh, two servers saying one value and one saying another, you can say, OK, the majority says this is the value. So yeah, democracy for the win, this is the value. You have only two. And you have like, you know, this says value is A, and this is V, it's like, eh, I don't know, I have to. So you basically have like at least three replicas of your, uh, of your data. And the way to do that, you can choose different ways. But uh, one way to do this is like, okay, imagine I have one key, and the key is the hash comes in this area, so it should go to B. So what I'm going to, be, uh, to do is like all the keys that will be stored in B, I store them also in C and in D. All the keys that will be in E, I store them also in F and in G. And this way, if this goes down, I still have these two to keep reading and writing. And in uh, mature systems, uh, you can do things like uh, you can take into account not only uh, different nodes, but also the geography, making sure that this and this and this are not the three on the same data center, or, or at least not on the same rack. So if the rack goes down, you know, you can lose maybe one or two of them, but not the three. It really depends on the system, uh, but you know, you can do those things. So data distribution, fairly easy. Data replication is just a number of having multiple copies. So if one is down temporarily or forever, you know, that's fine. And, and what you do is like, imagine B goes down, and I have two copies here. If B goes down because of a network partition, that's fine. We don't do anything. We uh, wait for a little bit. If we see B is not coming back, then we are, what the system is going to do automatically, as we ask to have always, in this case, three replicas, it's also fairly common to have more than three. But what is going to happen is like, uh, since this is down and we are not seeing it back, these two are going to start replicating to another one. So I always have three copies in my system. That's, for example, the same way it works with, uh, if you are working with big data with Hadoop, uh, the Hadoop file system, it's DFS, it works in this way too. You tell how many replicas. If one of the uh, servers goes down, it's going to replicate again. So you always have the number of replicas you wanted. Uh, and what about the, uh, the durability? It's like, OK, I have multiple copies. But if I give you an insert, how can I make sure that the insert is going to be durable? Imagine I insert in the node B. And before node B has time to replicate, node B goes down. Am I going to lose that? Maybe yes, maybe not. It really depends on how durable your system is. So what you want to do is like, if you want to have a system which is like durable, at least wait until one of the copies says, hey, I already have the data. So what you do is like, you store the data in the node, 
then you try to replicate to all of them. As soon as one is telling you, hey, I have the copy already, you are safe because if V goes down, you already have a copy in other place. Uh, how many copies you want to have? Well, it really depends on your use case and uh, on your data. For some data, you want to have like all the durability that is possible. For some data, you want to not to return the call until all the copies reply, hey, I have the change, it's commit, so you know. In, in some other cases, like, I don't really care. If it's like you're like, counting something, doing something stupid, it's like, yeah, you know, as long as one is, as, as long as the master, the, the first node is keeping the data, I can already, you know, if it goes down, I don't really care because it's a cache or it's like whatever. It really depends on use case. So at least you will have, you know, the, uh, if you want like a very durable system, you, you should have like half of the replicas plus one. So uh, if you have like three replicas, then you will have like you know, at least two of them. Because so that in that case, you are sure that if something goes wrong, you can always have the quorum. So you can always reproduce, which is like the authority value. So you can have like the right quorum, or you can have also the red quorum. And uh, in this way, you can have systems that are like always writable or always readable, because you can decide if you are going to apply the quorum when you are reading or when you are writing. But that's basically the way you deal with durability. Uh, and with this model, you are going to get conflicts. And you are going to get conflicts in, 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 in the case I'm writing in some place, and someone else is writing at the same time. I'm writing in B, someone is writing in C, on the same element, what do we do now? And you're going to get conflicts. And conflicts can be like, uh, oh yeah, I'm seeing this, but I thought I had deleted. And you know, it's still there. That happens a lot in auto systems. Or I create something, and I cannot see it like right now, which is quite bad. Or I have like different values. Some things should be unique. Those are conflicts. And um, you need to uh, have a strategy to deal with them. And uh, distributed databases, they basically have like several strategies. One strategy is like not having conflicts. If you have like a distributed database and you use like a quorum-based system, like uh, Paxos or Raft, which is like for coordination, in this case, you are never going to have conflicts because you always have like uh, some leaders that are like, you know, elected automatically. And uh, the problem with this is if you want to have like a quorum-based strategy with coordination and uh, temporary elected masters and so on, the change is going to be slower than in other systems. So first, it's, it's quite complex to, uh, to set up if you are doing it yourself. And the second, you know, it's going to have like worse latency. One strategy that a lot of databases, for example, Cassandra by default DAO, is like last write wins, which is like, yeah, if two are writing, the last one is the one who wins. And it's like, it sounds like a really bad idea. Well, not as, not as bad, because the thing is, if you can do very atomic writes, just two columns in one record, the possibility of two people updating the same column of the same record from different servers at the same time, depending on your domain, is like fairly, fairly, fairly low. So last write wins, the thing is like, it's very easy to implement. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, the last one is winning. I don't have like any conflicts. So that's, uh, that's good to have. But if you need something more uh, sophisticated, then you need to decide how you're going to be dealing with conflicts. And you can be, deal with con you can be dealing with conflicts either at right time or at real time. If you deal with conflicts when you are writing, the system, again, is going to have a uh, lot of latency because it needs to coordinate with different people. So a lot of distributed systems, they work, they work the other way around. You write, and the moment you are reading, you tell the system, I want to be reading at least from two replicas or from three. So if you are reading from two replicas, and uh, one is telling you the value is A, and the other is telling you the value is A, OK, that's fine. If you are reading from two, and one tells you the value is A, and the other is the value is B, it's like, OK, I want to have uh, another uh, opinion. So you ask for another replica to give you the answer, and it's like, oh, it was B. So yeah, B it is. So that's how you do conflict resolution. And sometimes it's not that easy doing conflict resolution because uh, you can have changes and it's, no, it's not as straightforward, but uh, there are some interesting strategies. I told you before about last write wins and last is a very interesting concept 
because last depends on the time. And the time in a distributed system is not easy. Because you know, the, the, the clocks can drift, so you can have like different times in different systems. And there are people doing things like really crazy, like Google has like an internal uh, store, which is not open source, and they have something like a, they have like a time servers inside the, the, um, the setting, and the time servers have two different clocks. One is like an atomic clock, and the other is a GPS clock. Because atomic clocks, they are like very precise. But when they drift, they drift a lot. So what they do is like they have the atomic clock, the GPS clock. If both are in sync, they are quite sure all the servers have the same time. But if one of them not, so it, that's crazy. You cannot build that on your open source database because you know you cannot force people. Oh yeah, download Cassandra. Uh, git, git, read me. Download Cassandra, buy an atomic and a GPS clock for each node, and just put it there. It's not going to. Uh, I mean, it's cool, but yeah, no, it's not going to happen. And by the way, if you are doing open source. Put always the read me, because some people, but anyway. So last is a very interesting concept, because clocks can drift away. There is something which is like very, 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 very widely used, which are like vector clocks. And many of you probably know what, what a vector clock is, but instead of depending on the time, I'm going to be depending on the sequence of things. So you all probably are used to GitHub. So this works like very similar to what you do in GitHub with the commits. I have. Here, three server. I have uh, server Y, uh, server sorry, server X, server Y, and server Z. So the first write goes to the data in the status one, goes to the first server. Uh, bless you. And uh, it's like server X gets the data and attach a version number. It's like I'm the server X. This is my version number right now, one. Okay. So it comes to uh, another write, and yeah, it's by the same server. Yeah. So new version of the data, server X, and this is my version 2. And now we have like interesting thing in which uh, the data is going to be written in parallel in two different, let's say, branches, two different servers. So server 3 is going to say, oh, the history, yeah, when I took the data, it was coming from server X in version 2, and I'm attaching this version now. And this is like, yeah, it was coming from server X version 2, and this is now. So when I'm reading, I can see here, they are diverging. They all have like different history. So if, they, if the data from one replica and the data from another replica, they are coming from different places, it means I have a potential conflict. It means that this data was written in parallel, no, from the same source, but then it was like diverging. So uh, it might be automatically reconciled because, yeah, it was changed, but it was changing the name and it was changing the email. So yeah, there is no conflict. That's fine. That's what you do with an automatic merge on GitHub. Or it can fail, and you can have a trolling in which uh, you can actually have a conflict. And the bad thing about this is like when you actually ha have a conflict on these databases, you, as the programmer, need to deal with the conflict. You need to decide what to do. So you need to automate in your application what to do with a conflict when you really have one. And you can do like a simple strategy, or you can just send a log, or send like a whatever, but you have to deal with that. It's something that you never have to do with relational databases, but here, you know, you have this kind of problem. But yeah, these are vector clocks, which are quite cool. The problem with that, with vector clocks, is like, you know, once in a while, you need to consolidate them, because if not, the history, as you can imagine, is going to grow and grow a lot. But yeah, it's done automatically. So once in a while, you do that, and that's fine. And as I told you, the client needs to fix the conflict sometimes. Most of the time, it's automatic, but maybe not. So we know already how to send data to different servers, how to partition the data, when we have conflicts, we see like, a few strategies. By the way, about conflicts, there are a lot of literature. Some, some, some very interesting, since I have time, I, I guess I can tell this. Some very interesting systems are using something called like conflict replicating data, something C CRDT, which are like data types that actually they never have conflicts. Imagine you have a, a, a counter and you are only adding. As long as you are only adding, no matter in which order or uh, in, in how many branches the counter is being updated in parallel, you can always add, and in the end, you get the same result. And you can do that for not only for counters, also for hash tables, for arrays. So there is like a new family of products, like for example, Vaso React and other people are using this uh, CRDT, which are like data types, which are basically designed for never having conflict, which is quite cool. So you know, you cannot model like everything there, but there are a lot of interesting things with conflicts. But uh, membership, how can I know which uh, other nodes are part of my cluster. So it's, it's, uh, you have 
a family of protocols, which are called like invention-like or gossip. And gossip works the way gossip works. Imagine I have a friend, which is called Mark. And I haven't seen him for a long time. And I'm thinking maybe he's dead. I don't know because you know. He's so I start asking other friends. So like, have you seen Mark? No. Uh, you was thinking he might be dead. Yeah, me too. It's <laughs> so like, have you seen Mark? No. But someone else told me he saw him yesterday. Oh, cool. We know he's alive. That's gossiping, and that's exactly exactly how these systems work. So the way they work is uh, instead of having like a central node which knows all the time which servers are alive. A central node means single point of failure. That's not, that node goes down, I have a problem. Also, a central node means I have to be like, communicating with everybody else. So that means latency. So a central node is like, and, and also it's not cool. So, you know, uh, so instead of that, what we're going to have is like, we're going to have all the nodes gossiping continuously to random friends. So it's like, yeah, I'm going to be asking this friend and this about, about you know, hey, have you seen people lately? Yeah, yeah, okay. And I'm going to be doing this like a few times a second. And uh, the thing with this is like they propagate changes like very, 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 very fast. Uh, how does it work? So imagine I have four servers in my system, zero, one, two, and three. So every server is going to have what we call the gossip list, which is just an array in which we are keeping how many heartbeats, how many uh, seconds, uh, milliseconds, whatever you mentioned ago, I've seen the node. Let's imagine if I haven't seen anyone in 20 seconds, I assume he's dead because I'm, you know, uh, <laughs> millennials. But anyway, so yeah, so I'm assuming he's dead. So the thing is like, okay, I'm the server zero and I've seen myself zero seconds ago. It makes sense. Okay. I'm the server zero. This is the server zero. Why? Why? This is server one. So server zero, I've seen server one seven seconds ago. Okay. Uh, he, he must be alive. I, I haven't seen server two since 23 seconds ago and server five since 25. So I'm suspecting these two might be dead. But I'm just suspecting. I want confirmation. So now this, well, and this server is like, okay, I've seen server zero seven seconds ago. Yes, we agree on that. I'm server one. I've seen myself zero seconds ago. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Uh, I've seen five seconds ago to node two, and this one must be dead. Because, you know, uh, so I'm sending this to this one, so we exchange our information. After we exchange, this is saying, oh, you know, I've seen myself, I've seen this like uh, right now, and I was suspecting of, uh, well, I was suspecting of these two people before, sorry. So this, this two sold dead. So the thing is, when this sending me the data, I change to this. It's like, yeah. I've seen uh, this server right now, and server two, I haven't seen it since 23 seconds, but this is telling me five seconds ago it was alive. So I'm going to update, and I'm going to consider it's still alive. But this, you know, I'm still suspecting it must be dead. And I have this copy, this matrix here, which is like what I know about the other servers. So I know at this point I'm suspecting of these two. I know that the last time the server one was not suspecting on anything. After he sends me the data, it's like, okay, now I know this is my suspect list now. This is me, zero. And I know the node one told me he's suspecting from these people. And he also told me that the node two was suspecting from this other one. So after this change, I have here the matrix in which more than half of the nodes think that, that this node is dead. So we are going to consider it dead. So the moment I get more than half of the people thinking, this must be dead, we have stopped communications. And until the node is not sending data to us and say, oh, he was alive, we are going to consider it dead and we are going to start doing like all the processes that we need to ensure the system is working. And this, this is quite cool. I mean, it's like a very simple protocol. We think about that. But the thing is, no, they, they, you just exchange information like very fast. And in just seconds, in any system, you can propagate like, you know, uh, for example, Netflix, they, they like to do like interesting things like, uh, tearing down all the servers. So they were playing and they were like tearing down a whole availability zone of Netflix just to see what happened. In two seconds, the new rights were like going to the new server. So, you know, in, in a very, very little time, you can actually detect if something is working or not. So it's quite interesting, like working with gossip. Uh, how do you deal with incremental scalability? How you deal with uh, the system is, uh, you know, 
is uh, having a lot of load. I want to add like a new node. So you can add a new node. And the new node is going just to be using gossip to uh, communicate with people. You tell the new node, hey, you tell the new node the address of at least one of the other peers. So when it starts, it's going to say, hey, I'm new. And uh, OK. And uh, it's like the, the system decides which, uh, which partition this uh, node is going to be having, or which partition is going to be having. And what we are going to do is like, during the staging time, it's going to get, to get data from the other replicas. And the moment he uh, has like, no, the node has again, like all the, rep all the data, it's like, yeah, I'm ready to serve. And by gossip, it's like the way of communicating. So apart from seeing if it's alive or not, we are also seeing the status. So am I alive? Am I staying? Am I ready? But that's, but that's basically the same way of, uh, of doing this. And this should be transparent and automatic. Uh, some systems, uh, they cannot have more than one node at, at the same time. Because, you know, if you have to be like replicating from different places, that starts to add like, you know, a, a, bit, of, a bit of things uh, to the system. But, you know, you can still keep adding a node at a time, and things are going to work in most systems. What happens if uh, at one point I... I told you I can have like multiple copies of the same data, that's fine. But what happens is if I, as a customer, want to write in one of the partitions, but I'm in Armenia, and I cannot see any node out of Armenia. And, I, and my bad luck is, OK, uh, the nodes with that partition are not actually in Armenia. So the system could say, you know, you, are, you don't have internet, you are, that, that's fine, I did what I could. But you can do something else. Amazon decided that uh, they wanted to be like always available. They always wanted to have, as a user, if you can connect to Amazon, you can always add something to the cart, always. And that, that's the premise of, uh, of uh, the uh, storage they have. It's like, you can always add to the cart. Maybe you can do other things, but adding, always. Okay? So how you do that if you cannot communicate with the replica? You do a hinted handoff, which is what you do when you are at work and, someone, and, and the courier is coming with a parcel which is not for you. It's like, oh yeah, I have this for this person. Oh, he went to the toilet. Okay, I'm leaving it with you and I trust when you see this person again, you are going to give... That's, that's the hinted handoff. So hinted handoff means if I have to write in one partition, but for some reason, I cannot see that partition right now because I don't have like network to them. Instead of writing that, I'm going to write to any server I can see. So as soon as I see one server, I send the data. And I tell them, please, this data, I know it's not for you, but keep it. Next time you see someone from this partition, send the data, and that's a hinted handoff. So you basically store... Oh, I, I thought I have like a pretty graphic here. I don't have it anyway. So sorry about that. Yeah, it was like a bit longer in the past, this presentation. So the thing is, you just put in the, in the server in a special area of the, of the file system, the hinted head of, and you attach the node, OK, this is for this other server, and that's going to work. The trouble with this is like, after a while, if that person is like uh, having a hard time in the toilet, maybe you can have like a lot of parcels in your table, especially, or if you are the, the you know, so that's the thing. And it leads to entropy. So in these systems, you have always like background processes running, that's, uh, it, which are like anti-entropy, which basically what they are doing is like they are taking care of, if there are a lot of hinted handoffs, they are going to try to consolidate, they are going to... Uh, I told you before, better clocks, you need to consolidate once in a while. So there are a lot of things happening on the background that you have to take care of. That's called anti-entropy. And you know, these systems also have usually like anti-entropy to consolidate things, optimize data, and basically ensure the system is like kind of working in, in, in order. Uh, and <laughs> the thing, I really like this. So the thing is, uh, when you have like a relational database, it's very cute because, you know, just send SQL, and the database is taking care of the complexity, and the client is quite stupid. The, 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 the client doesn't need to detect anything about data. When you are working with these uh, stories, as, I, as you saw already, you, have, you need to know how the servers work. You need to know to which replicas you need to be asking data for. You need to know uh, 
at any point, if you want one data to, to be coming from multiple copies, only for one, to be like highly available, what you want to do in terms of durability, in terms of conflict. So there are a lot of things that you need to turn in the client. So when you have, let's say, the driver, the driver must be much smarter than a traditional database and also your application. Because in some cases, your application is the one having to take to make the decisions of how you want to use the system. So the, the you know in the trade-off, it's like, OK, it's much more powerful, but uh, there are some things that I have to do on the application layer, which is maybe not as nice. You are not used to that. And at the beginning, it takes a little bit of, 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 you know, of uh, making the, the, the change of your mindset. So basically, the clients need to know in which nodes you are going to be sending the, the keys, and you have to hash locally the keys, and it has to be the same hash that uh, you're using in the servers. If not, you have a problem. I've seen this not working uh, once, and it was a disaster. And you have to be aware when one node is available or not, durability, different conflicts, a lot of things. I have only five minutes, but I'm finishing already, so that's fine. Now you know how it works the system, in which you are, you are like always on, you can scale, read and write. Data is stored across different servers. It can run on commodity chip servers. Uh, it's local to your users because you know, so you have like multiple, multiple replicas. If some replicas are in different parts of the world, it's going to be like faster for your users. You know? Then it will consolidate eventually in the cluster, but your users are going to have like very, resp very fast response time. You can scale up and down the system without uh, stopping. If you want to, uh, one, one interesting thing about the uh, hardware is like you don't want all the servers to be exactly the same. Maybe you are introducing like a new version of the operating system, like a bigger machine, a smaller machine. When you have like 20,000 servers for a cluster, you really don't want to have all of them with the same hardware because you know, it's not going to work. So you can decide to take whole hardware out, put new hardware in, those kind of things without stopping. It's quite cool. But we have like the extra ball which is like, okay, what if you want to build your own system? You could decide on all those things, but since you, you were in the box, you try like, like Java, Netflix, write Dynamite. Dynamite is like, a, it's an open source project that you can put on top of any data store and basically give you all of this. It's going to give you uh, replication, distribution, gossip, uh, anti-entropy, like everything you need. So just put it there. They use it because at the beginning, now in, in Redis, you have the Redis cluster, but uh, that didn't exist before. So they wanted to have Redis highly available and partition, and they create Dynamite. And you can put you know, anything you want behind Dynamite. But all the things, it's going to be like, no, it's, it's right there. And it's open source. If you like JavaScript, because yeah, why not? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so the people from Uber, Uber are, are awesome. They have like, like uh, millions of rights a second, and they also have these problems. So they build something called RingPop, which is like the same concept, but on JavaScript. So you can put Node.js and have like a distributed system with all those things. So if you have like, you know, an open source project with a storage, and you want to try, hey, how will this work in a cluster? You can just start from here, which is like good fun, and you, know, you don't have to do everything yourself. That's all I have. I'm not scared of this woman anymore. And yeah, well, and a bit, to tell you the truth. <laughs> he, he, uh, he's probably quite nice, but he doesn't look like that. And uh, that's all I have, so thank you very much. And if you have like, any questions, I'll be happy to answer now, or I'm going to be here for the whole day. So yeah, up to you. Yeah, uh, the question is, how do you know upfront how many segments you're going to have? And the thing is, you really, what you have usually is like 32 segments. And what you do is like, you distribute, in, in, uh, depending on how many nodes you have, what you are doing is like giving more or less uh, partitions to each of the nodes. So usually one node is dealing with more than one partition, sometimes even with a fragment of the, of the partition, depending on the size. But you also, like, logically, you always give like a number, and 32 is like something like, quite common. And that's like you know, lo your logical ring. And then physically, depending on how many nodes you have, you redistribute uh, how many segments are in terms of, of each node. So, that's, uh, so you can subdivide any one segment? Uh, that's uh, uh, on, only only a few uh, databases do that, but yeah, in uh, ideally you wouldn't have data uh, smaller uh, uh, that that the 32th part of the system. So it really depends, you know, how, how you think it's going to uh, work for you. But yeah, you have like you know, a fixed number, and then you work like physically what you have. Okay, 
So thank you.